Welcome back everybody, this is Jumbo Thick here with another Legendary Lord video. In this one we will be covering Wolfric the Wanderer. We will delve into his lore and really what makes him a unique character because I think he has a lot more character depth than most of the um, chaotic faction leaders that we uh, come across in Warhammer. And hopefully by the end of this video you will learn to appreciate him as I do. Wolfric the Wanderer, the World Walker, the Slayer of Champions. He has many names and titles, but before he was so named, he was simply Wolfric. Wolfric is a mighty Norskan champion of the Sarl tribe, a warrior born with the mark of the Dark Gods upon his flesh, in the form of prodigious strength and speed, as well as a nose like that of a hound, able to track people by their scent. But his most obvious gift was that of the teeth in his mouth, more akin to a wolf than a man. This was where he took his name from. Wolfric was ever renowned throughout the holdings of his tribe and beyond as a superlative warrior, feared for his strength and unmatched skill at arms. Wolfric forged his infamy by taking the heads of every rival Chaos Champion who crossed his path, proudly displaying them for all to see as declarations of his power and the folly of challenging him. In the violent societies of Norska, Wolfric was famed, and many sagas were sung to his glory by the Skull Chanters of the Sarls. However, his pride would eventually be his doom. A tribal conflict had re erupted between the Aislings and the Sarls, with the Aislings being led by their king, Torgald, a great champion of the Hound, or as we know him, Korn. The Sarls seemed to be outnumbered and outmatched, but the Sarl king was a chosen of Zinch, and came up with a scheme to save his people and slay his enemies. He offered Wolfric his daughter's hand, Hjordis, and all told riches if he would lead the Sarl army into battle. The battle would later be remembered as the Battle of a Thousand Skulls, where Wolfric slayed the mighty Aisling King by decapitating him in single combat, and therefore routing the enemy tribe. That night, as was the custom of the Norburn tribes, a great feast was held in Wolfric's honor. No man or beast, Wolfric claimed, had fought more fiercely in battle than he, and none, he swore, would outdrink him in victory. Using the skull of King Torgald as his drinking vessel, which would later be mounted as a guard on one of his swords, Wolfric matched his words with deeds. It had taken eight entire barrels of mead to put him under the table, a feat that had impressed even the ogre mercenaries that had fought along his side. Before the mead completely overwhelmed him, however, the drunken Wolfric began to boast of his exploits. Before he was done, he had slain every beast of the Chaos Waste twice, and personally slain every warrior on the field of battle. However, it was the champion's final boast that brought the doom upon his head. He claimed he was the equal of any warrior, of this world or in the realms beyond flesh. It is never a good idea to boast of your abilities if the eyes of the Chaos Gods are upon you, and Wolfric had certainly caught the attention of the Chaos Gods long ago. Shortly after his boast, Wolfric passed out and that night was visited by an emissary of the Dark Gods. In his dreams, the demon led him to paradises, necropolises, and fantastic netherworlds. He saw the gleaming towers of the elf folk, the gilded halls of dwarf lords, and the ramshackle fortresses of orcish kings, and everywhere he passed was drowned in great tides of blood. The demon spoke of how Wolfric's brazen words had offended his gods, but it also intrigued them enough to challenge their champion to prove his proud words. He was now charged to travel the four corners of the world and seek out the fiercest challengers, the most monstrous creatures, and the most ferocious adversaries and slay them in single combat. To prove his might, to appease his dark gods, Wolfric would have to make an offering of the slain champion to whichever god had tasked him with the challenge. For Korn, a skull for his throne, for Nurgle, the intestines and entrails, for Zinch, the last dying breath, and for Slanesh, the heart would suffice. If he failed, the demon explained, then his soul would forever be cursed by the gods and deemed unworthy to join them in their halls. He then spoke with relish of how the demons would take great pleasure in torturing his soul for all eternity should that come to pass. When Wolfric woke, he found himself speaking in a thousand languages, and his tongue had been twisted in a sharp, fluted shape like that of a bird's. A shaman of the Kurgan tribes recognized this as a gift of tongues, and enthusiastically pronounced Wolfric as blessed. Wolfric proceeded to torture the shaman on how to make the voices in his head go away, to no avail. That was when a seer of his clan instructed him to follow the voices and do as they command, and surely they would stop. The first test 
would be to hunt down a mighty tomb lord and offer up his shriveled entrails to Nurgle, the god of decay. Thus, Wolfric was charged to travel to the baking deserts of Kimri, the land of the tomb kings, a voyage undertaken by only the boldest of Northmen, for the desert lay many leagues far to the south of where the Norsemen made their home. In order to accomplish his newfound duty, Wolfric required a transport beyond the abilities of a mere lawn ship. In the end, it was Sigvtar, a grizzled marauder and longtime comrade, who solved Wolfric's conundrum. For he had heard tales of a ship blessed by the dark gods with the power to circumvent the greatest distances in the blink of an eye, which was in the keeping of a chaos sorceress scaling which Baba Yar, who dwelt in a vast fortress garrisoned by hordes of demons. With this information, Wolfric pooled all of his resources, from the silver Viglundir paid him to the captured treasures of King Torgald, to gather a mighty host of Norskins and managed to penetrate the fortress, slay the demons, and kill the witch by chopping her into pieces and boiling her alive in her own cauldron. He left all the treasure of the fortress to his warriors, and only claimed the ship his friend had spoke of, and named it Seafane. The Seafane was indeed no ordinary ship. For it was not mere flight that allowed it its legendary mobility. Instead, the launchship would fade from the mortal world into the realm of the gods, traveling upon the winds of chaos itself, past the hunting grounds of demons and the nightmares of men. The ship would sail upon phantom tides known only to the gods and appear again wherever Wolfric willed. With such power at his command, he was inescapable. Even the men of Norska, so used to the unnatural influence of chaos, could not help but feel awed and reverent whenever the power of the Sea Fang was worked. Indeed, with every invocation of the ship's magic, the demons bound within it demanded an offering of blood before they would ferry the Norsemen through the ethereal realm of chaos. The only offering it had a taste for was Wolfric's own blood, perhaps because he had been the one to slay Baba Yar, or perhaps it was just his blessings from the Dark Gods. Despite this, Wolfric made certain that with each new addition to his crew, he would feed the new warrior's blood to the dragon's head prow. No ship could serve two captains, and this was more true to the Seafane than any other, for any blood who would be accepted by the ship was quickly slain by Wolfric. And so Wolfric killed his first offering, and dedicated its innards to Nurgle. This would be the first of countless champions he would have to slaughter, and slaughter he did. Before long, Wolfric had little need to recruit men for his voyages, because warriors journeyed from all over the north to fight at the side of one so favored by the Dark Gods, in the hope that they might catch some of his greatness. Tales of a hulking champion, clad in black steel and bones, wielding a dark sword had spread so far as to be spoken in awed whispers by Kurgan nomads, as well as in the bloody halls of Norsk and barbarians. Thus, the fame of Wolfric grew to gargantuan proportions, and his name lived well in the, into the sagas of the north and the nightmares of the south. Wolfric, however, did not see his gift as a blessing, but as a curse, for this never-ending task would be his doom, and had stopped him from taking the hand of Hordis, the only other person besides Sigtar he cherished, and indeed the mighty wrath of the World Walker could only be quenched by that of his only love and her soft embrace. Wolfric wished to be rid of this curse and finally take his betrothed's hand and become the king of the sorrows, but he could not as long as he was constantly being pulled from his future lands and taken to the far corners of the world. One day after returning from one of his hunts, he was approached by a Kurgan shaman named Zarnath who claimed he could lift his curse. Wolfric nearly killed the man outright for such a bold claim, except that the shaman had demanded the sea fang in return and no man would make such a grand ransom for his services if he could not deliver, and so Wolfric agreed, much to the displeasure of his crew and Sivtar in particular, which warned Wolfric not to try and cheat the gods, for only doom could follow. Zarnath explained that in order to enact the ritual to free Wolfric, he would require an ancient artifact of the Hun sorcerer kings, the Smile of Sardis. The torque, he said, lay in one of the enclaves of the Chaos Doors of the Darklands, who sometimes had dealing with the Norsemen. With the Seafane's demonic transportation, Wolfric and his warriors journeyed to the foul lands of the Fire Dwarfs. There, they set out to the great fortress of Drangkol, or Fortress of Iron, in the debased Khazalid of the Chaos Dwarfs, where the Kurgan claimed the dwarven lord Korak and the Smile of Sardis could be found. 
Wolfric demanded that Zarnath accompany him and his men to claim the artifact and begrudgingly he obliged. It was many miles and after skirmishing with a group of hobgoblin wolf riders, the Norskins made it to the Chaos Dwarf Fortress to find it relatively unguarded. He tasked a few of his men to sow discord among the Dawizar by letting loose the orc slaves the dwarf kept in great pens not far from their walls. Once this distraction was in place, using Zarnath's magic to melt the massive iron doors of the fortress, the Norskins took the relatively unguarded courtyard easily. The only resistance being headed by a mighty bull centaur was brushed aside as Wolfric used his gift of tongues to challenge the half-dwarf, half-bull creature in perfect cause lead by asking, was it your mother or your father who was drunk? To which the bull centaur dropped its weapon and charged Wolfric to its death. Shortly after, Wolfric and his men made it to the mighty ziggurat at the center of the fortress. There they were impeded by a Dawizar sorcerer riding a Lamassu who made battle with Zarnath. As Wolfric spotted his prize being worn about the neck of Korak, he witnessed him retreating into the fortress. He and his warriors dashed inside hoping to catch him. Wolfric was nearly too late as Korak was getting away, but fortunately in earshot of Wolfric, for he heard the bellow, Korak, fatherless mongrel of a vulture, your ancestors were oath breakers and kin slayers. Small surprise their descendant doesn't have the guts of a jackal, much less that of a man. At this slight, Korak leapt at Wolfric, and with some effort was subdued. He was stripped of the torque that held the smile of Sardis, and was placed inside one of the large bronze bulls the Dawizar used to make offerings to Hashunt, and burned alive. With that being done, Wolfric led what remained of his troop out of the city as quickly as possible because the dwarfs had finally quelled the Greenskin Rebellion and were gathering in large numbers to hunt the Northmen down. It was at this time, shortly outside the walls of Drunkol, that Wolfric was informed that Sigtar had been mortally wounded. His friend died before they could make it back to the Seafane, but with his last breaths, he whispered to Wolfric that they had a traitor in their midst. Sviktar was placed upon a pyre and sent to the gods as befitting his station, and Wolfric slew the two Northmen that carried Sigtar in the camp out of rage and placed them upon the pyre as well as dogs to accompany his friend into the halls of his ancestors. Upon arrival at the Sea Fang, Zarnath was discovered to have lived through the battle and was attempting to convince the crew left behind to guard the ship that Wolfric and his men were dead. To this offense, Zarnath was nearly slain by Wolfric, but the only hope of his curse being lifted stayed his hand. With that, the Northmen were torn home to Norska. Wolfric's campaign in the Darkland took more time than he had thought, and in his lengthy absence, the Sarls, as well as their king, believed that the Kurgan had led Wolfric the Wanderer to his end, and so Viglundir continued on his plan to forge his new alliance with the Aislings. The arrival of Wolfric, alive after all, nobly put a dent in his plan, for as the slayer of their king, the Aislings both despised as well as admired the inescapable one. But Sveinborn, the Aisling prince, arranged to betroth Hordris, the Saul princess, decided to remove Wolfric, but he could not hope to match a warrior blessed with the mark of the Norskan gods, and so refrained from challenging Wolfric to battle. Realizing that he could not overcome Wolfric in an honest contest of arms, he instead resolved to find someone else who could. The next day, Sveinborn challenged Wolfric to personal combat within the Wolf Forest, a great arena the Sarls had built in Wolfric's honor, and where he screened potential recruits for his warbrand in lethal combat upon tall spaced poles just big enough for a man to stand. However, when Wolfric arrived, he found that he was not to do battle with Svineborn himself, but a fellow champion of chaos. A warrior who towered over even Wolfric, troll-like in stature, clad in blackened steel chaos plate, and bearing a massive demon axe encrusted with hissing runes of the dark tongue. Yet despite the apparent favor of the gods, the warrior was more akin to a maddened hound than a man. And Wolfric was appalled to learn that this creature was once Framir, a mighty champion of the Chaos Gods and war chief of the Aislings, who, as was the custom of the Aislings, led his fellow tribesmen to slaughter the Kurgan tribes of the East, and even pillaged and plundered the dolmens of the Beastmen. A hero throughout all of Norska, Wolfric could not believe that the animal before him was the same man when he roared his name in a bestial battle cry. 
Orphic felt something more akin to pity than fear as he saw his fate of a chosen of chaos should the gods tire of him. The Forsaken Champion was a daunting foe, but Wolfric had slain giants and demons like cattle, and no man set against him could ever be his equal in battle. Wolfric hacked off one of Franier's arms, but from the bloody stump a great spike of bone and meat erupted. When he struck him again, tentacles slithered out rather than blood. The hero sword clashed with the mutant's great claws, locked in a terrible battle until Wolfric drove the Forsaken off the platforms of the Wolf Forest, down into the spikes below, and then clove through his black war helm and split his skull in two. No man amongst Svineborn's Hesir's troubled Wolfric after that, for not a one of them had not borne witness to Freynir's monstrous ability in battle many times before, and the prospect of facing a warrior powerful enough to defeat the fallen Chaos Lord was nothing short of suicide. Their newest plan to slay the champion having failed, but Glundir and Svineborn conspired to instead kill Wolfric with craft and cunning. As befitting one blessed by Zinch, but Glundir had actually manipulated Wolfric into killing Torgal to pave this way for this new alliance. But the warrior persisted as a thorn in his side. To accomplish this, the Glundir enticed one of Wolfric's warriors, a marauder known as Brondulf, to slay the champion when he least expected on his next raid. Brondulf was once a member of the Glundir's court and favored Hjordis, though he knew he could never have her and so the Sorrel King once again offered his daughter as a bargaining chip to further his schemes. Meanwhile, Zarnath informed Wolfric that merely obtaining the smile of Sardis was one piece of the puzzle. He would now need to take it to a place of power in order to channel the necessary energies to remove his curse. Their destination would be Alfheim, or Ulf One as we know it, the home of the High Elves. Zarnath made specific instructions to not be touched as he gathered the necessary energy for his spell, and so Wolfric threatened his crew with a grisly end should anyone accidentally bump into the shaman as they headed on to Ulthwan. When they made landfall on the shores, Wolfric and his followers happened upon a group of elf maidens prating at a monolith, which they were informed was the place of power they had searched for. The Norskins wished to take these elves as slaves, for surely they would be worth much back home. But Zarnath warned the Norsemen that the maids were actually witches, and were calling upon strange arcane forces to smite the invaders, and convince them to kill them instead. With the dark abandon of their race, the Norskins fell upon the defenseless elves and slaughtered them gleefully. As the carnage abated, Zarnath mocked barbarians for their bloodthirsty ways, revealing that the elf women were not mages, but merely wives who had come to pray to Isha for fertility. Zarnath had revealed that he had never intended to free Wolfric of his curse. His wish was to see the champion dead, so he had sent him into the forest of the Chaos Dwarfs. And when that had failed, he decided the Azure would finish the job. The deceitful sorcerer laughed heartily, and Wolfric attempted to strike him down, but his blade passed harmlessly through thin air. Zarnath was never here, and immediately disappeared, but not before alerting almost every elf warrior nearby to their presence by sending a magical flare high into the sky. Stranded and surrounded by enemies, Wolfric and his warriors fought their way back to the sea fane. On the journey back, every one of Wolfric's crew met a grisly end, either full of arrows or skewered by an elven lance. Only the ferocity of the Norskins allowed Wolfric and one other warrior to make it to the coast. That warrior was Broendolf. Upon reaching the cliff where the ship was tethered, the warriors found out that the sea fane had been dashed against the rocks by a mighty murworm once they had left it. The fate of the Norskins did not seem pleasant, and with the elves nearby, Broendolf decided to tell Wolfric of King Volgundir's plan to kill him out of respect as a warrior and the, the debt he felt he owed his captain. For Zarnath's betrayal had cut Wolfric deep, and he had made every attempt to save his men from the Azur, each death visibly taking a toll on the champion. As all hope seemed lost, Wolfric leapt into the ocean in full battle armor and struck deep into the murworm that had destroyed his ship. The serpent, not expecting such feisty prey, retreated from Wolfric. The war walker rejoiced as he found the figurehead of the sea fang, the source of its power, floating nearby. As he cut his hand and allowed his blood to soak into the wood, he thought of all the people he would get revenge upon once he was back in Norska, and was transported somewhere very unexpected. The Seafane had taken him and Broendolf deep into the Empire, 
and Wolfric grinned as he realized that he had been taken to the place he wanted to be most. His lust for revenge upon Zarnath speared him to the Southerner's realm. The champion vowed that Zarnath would suffer greatly for dashing what little hope the Woldwalker had to have his curse lifted. Then Wolfric came up with a plan and left Broendolf at Wissenberg to discover Zarnath's true identity. He used the Sea Fang to travel back to Norska to retrieve more men and have a new ship built. No one was waiting for Wolfric's return, as Zarnath had made an appearance to the king and told him that the Woldwalker had been slain by the elves. So when Wolfric crept through the castle and into the bedroom of his betrothed, he was met with a disturbing reality which would forever change him. He slew the Aisling Heshir standing guard and burst into Hjord's bedroom to find Sveinborn forcing himself upon the princess. Wolfric threw the prince to the floor and proceeded to beat him unto an inch of his life with his bare hands. Only the arrival of King Volglundir and his honor guard spared the prince, as the king begged the World Walker not to end his life, for it would mean war that the Sarls would not survive. Wolfric then decided that he would not kill Sveinborn now if the king would make him a deal. Volglundir promised he would have the biggest ship ever to sail the Sea of Claws built for him, and he would have a mighty army at his back when he returned to the Empire City Zarnath had fled to. He would even throw in his daughter. To this, Wolfric agreed to everything except for Georges, for the smell of Sveinborn was upon her, and he could not stand the sight of her. The mighty troll tree was slain, one of the last of the remnants of a long lost tribe of tree men warped by chaos, and his carcass was used to make the new sea fang. Wolfric sailed into the Empire using great steel chains to tether the fleet to his ship. The Norsemen soon arrived in Reichland at the city of Weisburg, where Zarnath, known actually as Ludwig Stossel of the Celestial Order, who foresaw his death at Wolfric's hand, had fled to. Ludwig foresaw his own demise and thus went to great lengths to ensure the death of the Chaos Champion. Yet with every place he sent him to, the Champion only returned stronger than ever. Howling the name of Khorne, the Norsken god of battle, the Norse warriors butchered the way through the meager defenses of the Southland city in berserk rage. Wolfric did battle with and defeated a powerful warrior priest of Sigmar in the siege, thus proving the supremacy of the dark gods of the north over the gods of the south. The Baron of Weisborg was also slain, as was his wife, and the entire city was put to the torch and plundered of riches. Wolfric cornered Stossel in his tower, recognizing the azure glow of his eyes, and fought through a new Shapti construct the sorcerer had sent upon him in a last attempt to kill the war World Walker with dark magic, but to no avail. The Norsemen then subjected Stossel to the torturous death of the Blood Raven, in retribution for the scale of his deceit. His vengeance reaped, he offered the sorcerer's dying breath to Zinch, who took it gladly, but Wolfric still had other debts to pay. Wolfric saw to Prince Feinborn second, the Aisling had attempted to bribe Wolfric's men into betraying him, promising them a portion of the captured treasure. Wolfric, having no need for gold, promised his men everything in the Seafane's hold to help him in his own deceit. Wolfric explained to the trembling prince how he would cut off the chain links connecting most of the other longships to the Seafane, abandoning the other Norse in the Empire, while the Seafane took to the Realm of Chaos. Flying Sveinborn's banner on the ship, the tribes would blame Sveinborn, not Wolfric, for the betrayal, thus damning the prince's name for all eternity. Sveinborn bade Wolfric to leave him his honor, accepting whatever tortures Wolfric sought to inflict upon him, but the champion did not care. Wolfric utilized another torture to kill the prince, putting a snake down his throat while he screamed for mercy, and when Wolfric returned to Omskar, he threw Sveinborn's severed head at Viglundir's feet his features swollen by the venom of the snake, and spoke of how he had left the warriors in the lands of the Empire. Volglundir was shocked. The tribes would now surely descend upon him, demanding vengeance for the death and betrayal of their kinsmen. The king pleaded to Wolfric to aid him again, begging forgiveness for trying to cheat him. Wolfric laughed at the king's pathetic mewling and strode from the hall, his imagination swimming with the sight of Omskar burning and Vaglundir dying a terrible death at the hands of the chieftains of the other clans. Vaglundir desperately reminded him of Hjordis, but to no avail, for Wolfric had one last offering to make to the dark gods. In the bow of the ship, Wolfric stood. He held a bloody bundle of silk in his hands. His eyes were devoid of warmth, as icy as when he last gazed upon a Vaglundir. Slowly he reached into the bundle, lifting from within a gory strip of flesh. 
to corn the face I would have kissed. He flung the tatter of soft pale skin into the ski, to Slanesh the heart I would have cherished, to Nurgle the belly I would have filled with sons and daughters. Reluctantly, Wolfric removed a lock of golden hair from his belt, to Zinch the last hope of love. And with his final offering made, Wolfric the man died, and the slayer of champions was truly born. The gods had their champion, now and for all eternity. And with that, we conclude the grim story of Wolfric the Wanderer. Hopefully you have gleaned some insight into his character. For now, we will be moving on to the, his inclusion in Total War Warhammer as a legendary lord for the Norsecan tribes. It is in this sad and nearly broken state that we find Wolfric for the campaign for Total War Warhammer. The World Walker is going to be a duelist as befitting the Slayer of Champions and will have an ability, the Hunter of Champions, that will pin a lord or hero in place, allowing Wolfric to catch them and slaughter them with his very high melee attack of nearly 70 and a weapon strength of 490, making him an excellent hero and lord slayer. In addition to this, all mammoths in his army gain a bonus melee attack, his marauders will have reduced upkeep, and every unit in his army will inspire fear. This is a potent buff, to say the least. Um, makes it very difficult to engage him in battle because units that cause fear are often um, really good at breaking enemies and making them retreat, even though they might be able to slug it out in melee, but the fear effect will uh, break the enemy early. And the Norskins are prizing themselves on being able to hunt down broken enemies with their chilling aura effects. And it will make them a potent army, to say the least. Now, sadly, ship battles are not a thing in Total War Warhammer, but we will be seeing the Sea Fane make an appearance as an ability, which will act similar to the Wind of Death and will cause massive damage. There is no confirmation on whether it will be a single-use ability per battle or a multiple-use ability per battle, but we will find out soon. And that concludes my Legendary Lord video on Wolfric the Wanderer. He's certainly one of my favorite characters um, on the um, Chaos roster. Um, well, I guess the Norskin roster now. And I just find him so interesting. And hopefully you, you do as well after listening to this video. And with that being said, I have been Jumbo Thick. If you want to keep up with the channel, make sure to like and subscribe. But until then, I hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope I'll see you guys in the next one.